Good afternoon. I know you're all kind of fading. As an endocrinologist, I'll say the room's uh, diurnal cortisol variation is now at its trough. <laughs> but bear with me. It's just a pleasure to be here. It's been a great day. I've enjoyed all the presentations. I've learned so much and been deeply touched by uh, the families that came and shared their stories. So I'm here to uh, speak to you about the second newborn screen. It's a little bit obscure, but uh, something that uh, highlights uh, who we are in Alabama, because not everyone does it, and there's a treasure trove of information and diagnoses that we make that we would have never made, and that's what we're all about, finding children that we can prevent disease. This largely concerns the endocrine disorders, both congenital hypothyroidism and uh, congenital adrenal hyperplasia, but surely there are other uh, specialists who occasionally are picking up uh, children on the second screen. I heard today there was a child with cystic fibrosis identified only on the second screen. So um, just to give you a little nutshell for the next few minutes, I'll give you a little background on the second newborn screen. Um, I'd like to talk about some perinatal trends in thyroid and adrenal uh, tests just because we're, we're working with a moving target when we take uh, the timing of a test from right after birth to uh, two to six weeks after, uh, norms change and we need to have just a brief appreciation of, of what's going on as we try to interpret these tests. Then um, we'd like to share with you just, you know, what, what have we found in Alabama? Um, we have the data on all the babies who were screened for congenital hyperthyroidism and uh, CAH uh, over the last seven years. Uh, to tell you exactly what, who, who we found and how many diagnoses and, and how important it seems to us uh, to pay attention to. And then just this August, um, the CDC and the Applied Health Lab uh, posted their retrospective study on, on their thoughts on the second newborn screen, and I'll share a few slides on that just because you're going to hear about that study. Dr. Sontag mentioned it briefly and flashed a slide on it. Um, there's a lot to learn from that and a lot more to know. And then just share what, what, what seems to me, looking at all this research and what we know in Alabama, what some of the benefits and challenges are of the second newborn screen. So the second newborn screen is done in only 23% of newborns in the United States. There are nine states that it's mandated in, and you can see the list there on the top line. There are three states where it's heartily recommended, and Alabama is one of them, also Maryland and Washington. The definition of recommended is that greater than 85% are included, and I think that number is much higher for Alabama by 95%. Um, second screen states also use targeted repeat screens. Uh, you'll see us recommend certain thresholds, which we, we want you to get another specific screen that's different from the second screen. And also there's a special NICU premature infant and, uh, protocol in which specific other screens are uh, known. and that's independent of this mandated second screen. One screen states, which are 77% of newborns, they will also do other screens, again, targeted repeat screens based on certain threshold. If a number is in the mid-range or above a certain level, they'll ask a provider to get another screen to just find out which way that's going, up or down. And then they have the NICU and premature infant uh, profiles. So uh, the timing of the first versus the second versus the third and onward screen is very important when you think of congenital hypothyroidism. People measure two um, factors, the T4 and the TSH, but this slide just shows you the TSH, which is probably the most sensitive marker. And this is a histogram. Uh, what it's showing you, um, each line uh, shows you this, the spectrum of TSH values of normal infants at different ages. So you see the blue arrow where it says zero to one day. Um, one day. Those, um, um, that graphic picture goes, extends out to uh, TSH values to 100. And what it's showing you in the zero to first day of life, infants have a great spectrum of TSH values. So it's very hard to interpret what's normal versus physiologic. And as you move out to three to five days, the uh, peak tightens up. And so everything normalizes. And so if you get um, a TSH value beyond uh, at least 48 hours, you can expect that the numbers will be pretty tight and most of them will actually be under 10. Um, that's important because if you have a splay in data by getting a screen too early, like zero to one day, you may not be able to tell whether it's a physiologic variation or it's a true abnormal. So. Um, 
In the 60s, most screens were done at 48 to 96 hours just because we had time and we weren't counting dollars. And so we were actually in that tight peak. As uh, in the 70s and later on, early discharge were mandated and women were being sent out at 24 hours and under 48 hours, many of those first screens were occurring much, much earlier and then causing a lot of false positives, confusion, and it beclouds uh, what's a normal versus what's a physiologic. Uh, one of the interesting things is if you compare European data, which they have a lot of good data on newborn screening, just a lot of great studies they do, particularly out of Italy and, and England, they, they routinely do their uh, first one newborn screen, but they do it four to six days out. And that's why they can get away with one. Um, but they have very different findings because, you know, it's, it's a much different situation when you measure it out later. This is uh, the perinatal trends in thyroid hormone levels. It's a nice classic graph. The reason I bring it, if there's any people working in a NICU, um, you have to realize the, the vertical line right in the middle is birth. And, and to the um, left <laughs> is uh, the gestational period, where what you see for thyroid, uh, it's um, in the last uh, two trimesters, there's a progressive increase in fetal thyroid hormone production and the ev an evolution in the pituitary and hypothalamus. So the more premature a baby is, they've just not completely tanked themselves up, nor has that system been activated enough. And so when they're born prematurely, they have a very deficient uh, thyroid gland hormone production and a very deficient pituitary and hypothalamus. And this is why when we look at premature infants, uh, many of them have very low levels and they don't respond normally with a TSH. And it's really a moving target on a lot of patients to interpret those values. On the very bottom, I've just highlighted brain. Um, one of the um, important markers for a, an, a clinical endocrinologist in following up children with congenital hypothyroidism is the fact that once we commit a child to treatment postnatally based on a newborn screen, we'll treat them until three years of life. And that's based on that bottom graph, which shows that the myelination of the brain of a child um, um, begins sort of outside of some glial mal um, maturation earlier, the first peak, extends through uh, birth and then extends out to three, uh, three years of age. And so uh, the primary myelination is going on, and since thyroid hormone is so important for that process, no one will uh, stop thyroid hormone or reevaluate whether there's a long-term long need in certain select patients until after three years of age. And this slide, um, I don't want you to have too many, uh, too much data, but this is a graphic picture of why in NICUs, uh, when you screen for congenital adrenal hyperplasia, that's the other um, lab that we screen for, it's all over the place. And uh, we measure a compound called 17-hydroxyprogesterone in the filter, in, in the newborn blood spots. And um, to uh, to the left. <laughs> Uh, if you look at the uh, box and whiskers plot, plot, which Dr. Sontag was quite f fond of, you'll see that the levels are quite splayed and quite high in the more premature infants who are 23 and 24 um, weeks of age. That's just normal. And so we get a lot of false positives, a lot of high values. And then um, what you see above the box and whisker plots are the outliers. There's many high values, and we're constantly tracking that down, talking with NICUs. And so there's a protocol to uh, follow those levels, not repeat too many filter cards, and go to serum levels uh, on babies who they continually have high values, because serum levels can be much more accurate in terms of getting to the interpretation of high values. But I just want you to see that the, the difference and why, you know, there's so, so much discussion that's important sorting out which babies have a normal high level versus ones that have uh, early disease. Uh, this is the final number chart, um, but I want to point this out. This um, is a pretty good table out of uh, JCNM, a, a very good journal, published in 2012, just looking at normal TSH values in infants. And the reason I put this up here is um, if you look out at one week of age in a cohort of healthy uh, infants, and this is measured by serum, the serum TSH, two standard deviations above the normal range, is less than six. Now that correlates um, with um, a blood spot level of 12. So we set our levels at 25, even on our second newborn screen, but we're way above what's considered a, a, a normal TSH in babies. So it really should be under six after two weeks of age. So here's a case example. Um, one of the reasons um, 
Cindy actually shared with me that um, Alabama went to a second newborn screen in 1979 um, was because people were observing that um, they didn't catch everything on the first newborn screen. A lot of kids were getting by, and, one, and, the, and the one disorder that we've noticed that a lot in is congenital hypothyroidism. So here's a classic case example, and uh, we noticed this too. A, a baby was day two, had a normal specimen done on day two, which is advised, 48 hours. The T4 was 13, which is well within the normal range, and the TSH was 16, very normal baby. But because of the second uh, mandated screen, or recommended, but we all do it. Um, the T4 on the second screen at day 10 was 10.7, but the TSH had risen to 35. Now, based on that graph I showed you before, a, a TSH should really be under 6. So it was going up, even though the T4 was normal. And so the uh, providers recommended in consultation uh, to get a serum value and look here at day 30. The child was also already hypothyroid. That's a free T4 value, which is a serum value, but it was low. And the TSH had proceeded, proceeded up to 203. So this is an example of a classic case of a child who was missed on the first newborn screen but had a severe hypothyroidism that was affecting um, serum levels. So I would like to just share with you um, Many of you who are providers wondering, we got the first screen right. How are we going to get by and do another screen you want us to do? Um, and to show you that at least from what we can see now, and, and this will be under a lot of um, discussion over the next decade, I'm sure, we do pick up real disease. Um, so I would like to present to you what we have from our clinical database at, at Children's, which actually includes all the children in Alabama. Uh, diagnosed with um, congenital hypothyroidism and congenital adrenal hyperplasia um, every year. And we have data uh, since 2008 up to 2014 um, because of the support we received from the Alabama Depo Department of Public Health to keep us going. So I'll show you some data for congenital hypothyroidism. We've di identified 30 to 35 uh, um, we usually identify a total of 30 to 35 children per year with congenital hypothyroidism. And for congenital adrenal hyperplasia, about three to four, five some years, and we've had some years that are seven. So I'll give you kind of a breakdown of both of those so you can see the magnitude, and, and it'll help you understand why we're talking about it. So this is our data. Um, the uh, graph to the um, left is T4 values, and the graph to the right is a TSH values, and these are just, um, each bar represents a child, so in the last seven years during this time period, we picked up 13 term infants only detected on the second newborn screen. These kids had completely normal first newborn screens. And what you see in the uh, first bar graph on the left is that uh, the first screen T4s were at an average of about 13.3. And the second screen uh, T4 levels were 7.45, so they were dropping. And if you look at TSH, you can see that all of these children were normal on their first screen. But as you look uh, to the second screen, the average TSH was 102, which for us is a, is, a, is a red alert. That kid needs to be on thyroid hormone. And you can see there's quite a variation, but all of them are abnormal. So this really impressed us looking at that. Another group that's very, very special, and I, and I think it needs more study, um, is the cardiac infants, the infants with congenital heart disease. And what we've noticed just, you know, by working at UAB and all those babies coming through for surgery is that we pick up a lot of uh, late onset congenital hypothyroidism in these babies. So in the last seven years, we picked up six babies with this. And uh, it often occurs late. Some of it's thought to be maybe to the iodine load that they get from uh, intravenous contrast for their many catheterizations, but uh, it needs to be studied long term. But here's the data that we have. This is from Alabama. This is our data. And if you look at the T4 levels in these babies, on the first screen, 8.8. .8. On the second stream, it's already dropped to 3.3. That's profound hypothyroidism. And then if you look at the TSH, which is a marker of hypothyroidism, it's the um, pituitary and hypothalamus sensing what's going on. You can see that these babies on their first screen were, per were totally normal, but on their second screen, the average TSH was all the way up to 228. These, these kids were significantly hypothyroid. This is a, a place where we want to come in immediately and treat them with thyroid hormone because of the neurocognitive uh, um, problems. So it's quite some, that's a quite an impressive group, and um, we need to learn more about that.
This is just a, a graph just showing you the, the time uh, of, of these, uh, of how this unfolds. This is um, five, six, about seven patients that we looked at in 2008 to 2011, looking at their newborn screen values on filter cards over time. And the red ones are actually the cardiac babies. But what you can see is there's a clustering of normal dots down on the left lower quadrant where um, the TSH value is totally normal. And then as you move out, you can see how the TSH has risen over um, the subsequent uh, screens. Sometimes people have repeated the same screen. We say if you get an abnormal twice, go for the serum levels or whatever's diagnostic. But you can see that some of the cardiac babies in the red lines have, were diagnosed out at a month of age. And they passed their first newborn screen. And then finally, uh, this is our data on 10 premature infants who were again detected by second newborn screen. Um, the uh, T4 values are kind of similar in this. It's very confusing between the first and second screen um, because babies have a suppressed hypothalamus and pituitary. They're coming out like mid-gestation. Remember I showed you how they hadn't quite developed their thyroid hormone and their pituitary hypothalamic axis. So they don't really regulate well. So. Um, on the first screen, the average is lower from 3.7 to 2.4, but you really see it in the TSH. On the first screen, many of these kids are missed. And this is why we do the, uh, the late uh, screen and uh, NICU babies out at 28 days. Because if you look early on, they just don't respond. They're, it's like their pituitary and hypothalamus hasn't woken up. You think about it that way. And so they, they'll pass that first screen, but it, you look at them out at their second screen and look at that TSH of 200, that makes an endocrinologist cringe. Uh, that's really high. This is a summary of what we've noticed in the, in the last seven years. Uh, 29 infants have been detected by a second newborn screen for congenital hypothyroidism. That is 12%, 12% of all the congenital hypothyroidism that we've identified in that period of time. So that's one out of, a little one over 10, one out of 10. And now I'd like to switch just to congenital adrenal hyperplasia, which is the other disorder that um, we had a presentation on with the, with the Jeffers family. And uh, this is only one slide. And uh, this, we have found eight term infants uh, with real congenital adrenal hyperplasia only on their second screen. This one I'm a little even more concerned about because two of the babies were salt wasters. That's the most serious kind that can lead to um, cardiorespiratory arrest at death. So what you see here on the cluster down the left, again, the first screen was around 21, and there's each one of those bars is one baby. And then on the second screen, you can see it jumps up. The two high bars were the salt wasters, uh, and the average clearly going up. And in that cohort, we found two salt wasters, three virilizing. Virilizing babies are important to check. They won't probably go into adrenal crisis, but these childs can suffer very, very high virilizing levels. They can come to us in clinic uh, completely through puberty at age six or seven and uh, be profoundly runted in their height and then suffer all the ramifications of early uh, pubertal development. A lot of psychological trauma from that. And so the summary of our uh, findings on uh, congenital adrenal hyperplasia is that there were eight diagnosed two with life-threatening, salt-wasting, congenital adrenal hyperplasia, three with virilizing, and then three with non-classical. This is the mild form. This is the way of uh, newborn screening now is as a consequence of getting better and better at it, we do feel pick up some mild forms. Each subspecialty has this factor. You find the mild diseases, they're still important. We have to follow them long term. So 40% of all the infants that we've uh, detected by both screens were found on the second screen. So um, this is the same slide Leslie Pitch uh, shared with you that uh, congenital adrenal hyperplasia is a spectrum. And that's why even though we'll set a cut cutoff up here might be salt wasting, here might be, it's very difficult to know exactly what's cut off because it's influenced by so many factors. But it's really a spectrum of disease even though we categorize it as we do just for clinical purposes. And that's why um, um, we're picking up a, a variety of diagnoses when we look out a little bit. This is just a clinical spectrum, just to remind you that um, from salt wasting down to non-clinical, uh, to non-classical, there's, there's many, many, many different side effects. I think for, you know, just in terms of getting acute disease that's really treatable and needs to be preventable, catching all the salt wasting and the virilizing, of which we're, that's five of the eight, uh, we want it, we, we, we hope that we can catch these on newborn screening because we can make a difference in the lives of the children. So I have three slides. I know it's late. 
But I just, I, want, I felt obliged to share uh, a study that's in press now, came out in August of this year, looking at uh, a retrospective review of um, the value of second newborn screen. It's uh, published by the CDC and the uh, APLH labs, and it was a cohort that was, um, it was a retrospective study that was christened in 2006 by the Secretary's Advisory Committee. The thought was about 12 states are doing it. Try and get them all together and see if you can get some retrospective data. Well, this was a daunting task, sort of like herding cats. But um, I have to admire Dr. Shapiro and his group for pers persevering with this. What happened of the 12 states, five, um, seven hung on, of which Alabama was able to contribute data. And so they actually had data. These are um, uh, s states that do two screens who actually participated. So only seven of the 12 participated. And um, they had data from 2003 all the way up to 2011. Alabama's data was uh, the last four years. The retrospective uh, data on congenital adrenal hyperplasia, just asking the same question, is it worth doing a second newborn screen? And um, it turns out that it was Alabama and Texas that in the end provided the data for this study. So it's not surprising that the findings, even though Texas is much larger than us, the findings are very similar to what we found, which if you just look at, uh, you can look at the incidents in this paper, I've given it to you, it's still in press, but you can get it online, is um, of the babies uh, that they found 36% were detected on second newborn screen, and we found 40%, and that they did find a, a, a significant number of salt wasters and virilizers. So it seems that at least between Texas and us, we're finding the same thing, that we're picking up significant disease on the second newborn screen for congenital adrenal hyperplasia. And, and the, the data on congenital hypothyroidism, oh, this was a hard study. If you try and look at this data objectively, and I, I give them credit, you're comparing apples and oranges and grapes and plums and carrots and cabbages because every state is a little different in how they do the screen, what they use for thresholds, uh, what they do, whether they do T4, TSH, TSH alone, Alabama does T4 and TSH, the timing is different, the ethnicity of the different groups is different. So uh, their conclusion was a little bit, I thought, initially disturbing, but I, I think it's it needs to be, and they admit themselves, and Dr. Sontag mentioned that also herself because she showed you the, the study that um, um, because there are so many variables and you're trying to put back a retrospective review from seven of 12 states, all of whom do it differently, they found that the detection rates for congenital hypothyroidism were no different from the detection rates in one, for one screen states versus two screen states. And you would intuitively say, well, two screen states are gonna find more. And that's what our data, just looking in our little state, is that we're, we're finding more. Um, but that's, you know, that's a consequence of um, what, what happens when, when you do a retrospective study, and, and I'm sure that'll be discussed for years to come. Well, one thing that came out of a multivariate analysis is that it seemed that uh, certain ethnic groups were picked up more on the second newborn screen, which is interesting. So um, the Hispanics and Asian Pacific Islanders uh, were more represented in the um, second newborn screen. So we don't know what that's about, but that's something to pay attention to. And um, their conclusions were, just as Dr. Sontag said, it's, it's a very difficult retrospective analysis. And uh, the, what I take from this is it's very important to have intrastate analysis, like we've done, that you've really got to do it one state, one state, one state, and then do it really well, and then compare the data. But when you try and do it across time, it's really hard to know the meaning of the statistics. So it still was very impressive, and um, we're glad that that study was done, but there's more to learn. So I'm going to summarize uh, just the what I think are the benefits and the challenges of second newborn screen, uh, and you can kind of look at the data. I think it's here to, I think it's still important to do. Um, but we, we know that we identify new and clinically important cases. Um, we know that in the cases we found, early treatment does avert mortality and morbidity, significant hypothyroidism, significant salt wasting, congenital adrenal hyperplasia. What this does, it also is you're going to pick up a cohort of milder disease, so it shows us a wider spectrum. That's something 
all uh, subspecialists are dealing with. What do we do? We catch the big ones, but now what do we do with the milder ones? That's, that is a big question that we all have to answer. The second newborn screen acts as a safety net regarding the first screen. We know that there are deficits. Some of them are missed. Some of them are late. So that's not why it was designed, but it, it, it ends up being a safety net. There are some that we actually catch that we might have missed on the first one just because it was on Saturday or some other reason it wasn't done. And I think one of the important things about it is Alabama was the only southeastern state represented in this 2015 CDC study. So I hope that new steps will continue to watch the 12 states, including Alabama, which is representing the, you know, the, the, the cultural, ethnic environment of the southeast in terms of uh, learning more about this screen. And uh, these are some of the challenges, like anything we've talked about, there are benefits and challenges. We have the mild disease variants that are identified, and some of those need more extensive testing to, to find out what's going on. Sometimes treatment is unclear. Do we watch them? Do we treat them? Some of the non-classical CAHs, some of the mild congenital adrenal hyperplasias, we spend a lot of time on those kids trying to sort out, should we treat, should we not, should we do some more fancy testing? But all those kids are just as important because they're part of the, the, the whole smorgasbord, I guess. And uh, long-term outcome studies are lacking on uh, a lot of these patients. And so that, I think this is a, we're at an ideal time now to start looking at, you know, what happens to these kids who are just diagnosed on second screen? Are they a different kind of disease? Do they have a different course? So that's ripe for looking at. There's an extra expense versus delayed diagnosis that's always going to come up. Um, and I, I think something that needs to be addressed, and some, some centers do that the second screen is not necessarily a, a, a adjusted to postnatal nasal uh, natal norms. Like, and that's particularly true for the TSH. As I presented, true TSH values are a lot larger. And, and when we do a second newborn screen, we keep this threshold the same as we do for the first. Greater than, uh, under 25 is normal. Well, the truth of the matter, that's a, we're catching only the really significant disease. If we dropped it down to what's normal, there would be, we w I'd have work from now until the next 50 years, we'd catch so many more. So it really has to be interpreted in better norms and prospective studies are needed. So um, I just have to take a minute to thank Leslie, Leslie Pitts. She's the best colleague to work with, nurse practitioner. She's really the engine of the uh, endocrine practice and the data. And the, I just love working with her. And she's made it all this possible. Um, and so, you know, you are welcome to call us. If any of you providers have any questions about endocrine disorders, we're always happy to talk about it. We're interested in what your questions are and interpreting any test or any other questions. And I'd also like to thank the, the newborn screening program in the lab laboratory, Danita and Lynn and Ashley and Rachel. You know, it's just great working with such dedicated people. So thank you very much. <laughs>